Good afternoon, dear friends. I'm very happy to welcome you on behalf of the Garage Museum at the second um, uh, art book fair and uh, the presentation of um, uh, Gilda Williams' book, uh, How to Write About Contemporary Art. This is uh, a joint program um, together with Art Margin and Publishing House. And uh, I'm very helpful to my colleagues uh, uh, for their work on these books. And uh, now I would love uh, to give the floor to Gilda Williams and the curator of uh, Garage Museum, Valentin Diakonov. Thank you for Diakonov. coming to present your book in Russian. Thank you for uh, The first uh, question is, how many languages? What is the number of this language in the, you know, this book's existence? Uh, is this all? Is this all? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this, the Russian edition and the Korean edition have come out first. The rumor, I think there's a Turkish edition, I think there's a Spanish edition, I'm not 100% sure. So these, this is the, uh, the first of two, the first two translations, Russian and uh, Korean. That's quite a curious geography, don't you think? Yeah, well, they're both um, different alphabets, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so not necessarily, I mean, in most of the world, English is the lingua franca in the art world. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's interesting that they, they're this very peculiar, uh, they have a very different writing tradition also, uh, so uh, perhaps that's perhaps that's why. I mean, it's quite weird for, of course, like everyone, the Russians are the greatest writers in the world. So to be to, to be Thank you. presenting a book called How to Write to, in in Russia seems quite quite um, very flattering and, and uh, surprising as well. Um, what is the purported audience of this book? Well, who who do you want to teach how to write? Good question. Um, a lot of artists are asked to write and have not trained for that. I think that would be my ideal audience. If you think about it, the art world, there really used to be just uh, very few people wrote about art. They were critics and historians. Uh, and as uh, over the course of the 20th century, artists have fought to talk about their own work. Uh, but actually, collectors uh, have someone in their team who writes about um, art, websites, every, every member of the art world, at least at student level, has to uh, write about art. It's, it's, it's just a widening of the cast of people. Of course, there's many, many more roles in the art world, public relations and, and all kinds of new roles, all of whom have to write about art. Um, so um, there is maybe an assumption it's for art critics, but I don't think it's mostly for art critics. I think it's for everyone. Um, who works in the art world. And it's also, it also, I think, learning to write about art is learning to look at art, okay? It's learning to see how visual information works and being able to put that into language. So uh, my hope is it would be for anyone who's interested in understanding how contemporary art works. Do you maybe want or subconsciously want <laughs> to make people want to write about art? Oh, Forgive me the so. question. So <laughs> yes. could it be an inspiration for people to, who do, do not write to kind of try and do something. Yes, and also um, writing in the art world is considered a low-level job, by and large. You enter a gallery, let's say, and you're the person who writes the press releases. It is not auction houses, it's the lowest level people who are writing the catalogs, which is interesting because it's a very difficult job and it's also uh, given to the least experienced members of the art world very often. Uh, people make fun of press releases all the time, and as I write in the book, it's for me they're like cries for help from people who are really struggling. They're struggling. They they don't want to just be told what you're writing is silly and doesn't make any sense. Okay, well, how do I improve? And there's there really is very little space to learn that unless you go to a critic. You know, you go do an MA in critical writing. They don't want an MA in critical writing. They want to get through the basic art writing needs that everyone working in the art world has. And uh, write, artists who write, as yes. you mentioned, are the artists who have a special position in the history, both yes. in the history of art and uh, the now, the contemporary situation. Uh, why do you think that is? Because, well, for a lot of people, writing is not a necessity for an artist who thinks visually and who right. expresses uh, herself visually. Right. So uh, well, how do you have a, a kind of a historical perspective oh, on when sure. it began to be necessary for an artist to oh, write? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's very easy. It's as ever, it's Duchamp and the ready-made. So when you looked at an upside down urinal, okay, the intuitive ideas about art 
So form, beauty, grace, originality, craft, all those ideas went out the window. Mm -hmm. You had to have a little nugget of language-based information. This is a radical gesture and, and a specific term, which is ready-made, in order to access the work. It was language-dependent. And it was also the artist made it language-dependent. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we know over the course of the 20th century, for example, Greenberg, uh, Clinton Greenberg, really hijacked meaning for Jackson Pollock. He really spoke for Jackson Pollock, and Jackson Pollock resented it. All right? He said things about his work, which were very good. I mean, actually, Pollock was quite lucky to have mm -hmm. Greenberg. Uh, but he really resented it. Uh, and there was a real desire for artists to um, be able to write themselves. And there are great, you know, the Smithsons and the Donald Judds and the Adrian Piper, they were great writer artists. Uh, but the kind of blanket requirement for all artists to write is, I teach artists, is very, 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 um, it's, it's, it's threatening, it's difficult. And of course, if we look at, we were talking about this before, if you look at the artists whom we respect in particular now, uh, whether it's Hebrew <laughs> Sterl or uh, John Kelsey or Francis Stark or Liam Gillick or Seth Price, they're all great writers. And we read their work much more, their art writing more than critics' art writing. So it's an extremely valuable ability for an artist to really be able to write, to really, really have a, know how to develop an idea through language. Uh, so it's not a technical, it's, it's technical, but it's also a kind of faith in what writing can do. Mm -hmm. uh, and not just accompanying, coming as a second thought to the artwork, but actually accompanying the artwork. I think we're going to probably see that more and more. More and more. Okay. Yeah. I mean, for example, at, so I teach at Goldsmiths at the University of London. Um, increasingly, we get art students who are actually writers. And I ask them, why don't you go, you know, why not do a creative writing program? Because art schools are more interesting. It's exactly what happened at film in the 90s. Good filmmakers some good filmmakers chose to go to art school because it was a more interesting place. And we got Steve McQueen and, and other directors who came out of art school. I, I, I think art schools might be generating some very interesting writers. That's my guess. Um, because m more and more I see that their, their writing ability is just far greater. And it, it's a problem for artists who don't write so well. I think they feel it. <laughs> it's like when you, when you write, when you're an artist who, write, who writes something uh, about her work or about works as a whole, as Donald Judd d did. Yes. You kind of have a uh, common ground with the people who are supposed to react to your work. So you're in a privileged position uh, because you can write. Yes, yes. And Is that a, so? Yeah, and there's a sense of, of special access that the artist has. Uh, I always, I mean, when I teach curators to write, I always, I, I, I really encourage them to be very, very suspect of what artists write, because they, 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 they don't necessarily uh, cover all of, um, of the ideas there, right? They have no monopoly. They have no, I don't think, a particularly privileged position on commenting on their own work. Artists might disagree with me. Uh, they are a voice among many, but they are considered privileged, uh, although I'm very skeptical about it. I think I'm interested also uh, in artists who, who experiment with language. I mean, I'm always interested, for example, in, in Warhol example. Warhol could not write. Mm -hmm. he, he literally could not write, but using a machine, using a tape or a quarter, and someone who could, could fill in all the empty spaces, he wrote book after book after book. So that, that seems a very, very creative way to think about art and language, which isn't necessarily sort of artisanally uh, writing it out yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's also exciting possibilities. Machines, ready-made text, or any, any, all of the uh, options you know, that are available. Could you elaborate on that ready-made text thing you, you mentioned? What, what do you mean by that? Well, okay, so there's, a, there's a, a poet in New York named Kenneth Goldsmith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, guy, so, the guy who had the uh, privilege of uh, reading his poems before uh, the Obama family at some point? Yes, yes, he was a point? poet laureate, yes. Po poet laureate, yes, yeah. forgot the word. Okay. And he uses, I mean, he says with, he's a poet, but he's also very, very close to the art world. He was a sculptor himself. Uh, and he really says that with the internet, literature and writing has met its photography, all right? A machine that is in some ways able to do that with more rapidity and accuracy than we can. And so he's, he's, he's looking at um, all kinds of ready-made text. So for example, uh, he looks at your internet browser, 
If you look at your internet browser, it's a very embarrassing thing because you can really see your stream of consciousness. You're shopping, then you're looking up at something at a museum, then, you're, then you spend 15 minutes five looking time, for a trainer. And you're thinking, what am I looking for? They're all the same. And it, you look at that brain, he looks at that as a kind of portraiture, actually, mm -hmm. of a very, very, very authentic picture of who you were two weeks ago. Um, so that, that would be an example of a place where ready-made text and uh, the art world are but, uh, coming together. Related to, to anyway, art writing. Related. <laughs> uh, yeah. re related to art writing. Mm. What kind of ready-made texts uh, could uh, aspiring art writers uh, maybe, you know, imagine doing? Um, well, I never use ready-made text because the pleasure is the, yeah. the, the unexpected. Yeah. Um, and I always, I really think that... Um, one thing I teach a lot with my students is that you can do a lot of research and planning and bringing all of your ideas somehow to the page, uh, but actually something's got to happen when you're writing. Okay, something should happen while you're writing that you did not plan for, uh, and then and then and then and then you have exciting art writing or writing about anything actually. Uh, yeah. So that's rather the opposite of ready made. That's kind of accepting, you know, um, admitting your own intuition. As it as it happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's get a little bit back to the backstory of this book okay. because you, you you have a yeah. quite amazing story. It's not a book that was commissioned as no. it is. No. It kind of grew out of a very specific necessity of yours. Yeah. So could you please tell us about <laughs> your uh, background? You write, obviously. Yeah. You teach yes. writing. Yes. You and edit. I was an editor. Yeah. Could you tell us about these roles and yes. how they can came about in your okay. life and how they did uh, lead you to this. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I've, I've um, well, one thing, I always loved art and I loved literature. And you, you just have to pick one. You either want good writing or good or art about writing about text. You could never put them together, which there's no, re there's no reason why writing about art shouldn't be completely enjoyable. And there's no reason. So I was an editor. Mm -hmm. at a magazine called Flash Art and then at an art publisher called Fiden. Uh, and often we use very, we wanted to coach very young critics through their first big text. Uh, so I had come up with some helpful ideas about how that's, how that's done. So I already had kind of some preparation. And then I, about 10 years ago, I went into teaching uh, at Goldsmiths and elsewhere. And, I, and students, they really struggle to, to know how to write. And so I would put the same principles to work with my students. And I'd really road tested these ideas for a long time. I mean, sometimes people ask me where, you know, the, you just created these rules. And they're not rules. It's, I've really looked at hundreds and hundreds of texts and how they tend to be built up and kind of analyze that and put in a book. Uh, but as I was telling you, I, so I teach, and those of you said, there might be some teachers here, you know, you're not allowed anymore to say, Here's how to write. <laughs> you have to be very encouraged. Oh, that's a nice idea. Yeah, we could try that. Gold stars really, and all I, that stuff. Yeah, yeah, gold stars. But really what I was thinking is, this is never going to work. I wish I could just say, stop. This is what you do. So I, so I started writing that book, the one, look, this is what you do. Okay, this is where you start. This is how, where, you know, if you have nothing to say about an artist, you're never going to write a good text. It's impossible. It's never going to happen. Uh, and and even much more practical rules: how to get over writer's block, how to how to how to take notes. Um, and then I had a very encouraging uh, commissioning editor at Thames and Hudson. I was writing another book for them, and she said, she asked me, "Do you have any do you have any crazy projects?" And I said, "Well, I, I, yes, <laughs> funnily enough." And she liked it, and her editors liked it, and so I wrote the rest of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's the story. Uh, and what, what's what's the you know how does the uh, English edition, the original edition of this book, uh, how does it exist in uh, England in, in the English-speaking world? Is it adopted by universities? Do people use it as a teaching tool, or how it is? You it's know? it's very big in the UK. It's big in Canada. It's mm -hmm. big in Australia. Australia. The Americans are slightly resistant. Why is that? I don't do you, what, know. What do you think about it? I don't know. I don't know why Ameri are there Are you American? Is that where you're laughing over there? <laughs> it's just funny that you're, I'm British living in the States. I'm American living in England. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we're, so we have a major language divide, obviously. <laughs> um, but, and a uh, very complicated one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure why the Americans are uh, the least uh, so far. I was told that they're slower. I just need to wait. 
So uh, okay. maybe maybe that's maybe maybe they're just trying to make me feel good. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, and also in a lot of you know it's it's it does well in Germany, for example. It does well in in places where obviously they know English. But you told me that you didn't find it very funny. See, in, in, in English, it's been, it's it's quite funny. My book, I've been told. <laughs> so maybe maybe somehow that's been lost in translation. Um, um, oh well. Well, I, I, I'll never know. I have to tell I have to tell uh, okay. everyone. I think I've told you that after, before I was a curator, I was an art critic. So. Uh, all the examples and the structure of your book and all the, the stuff that you've put into it, it's, I can't laugh about it because it's a trauma. <laughs> it's like, I, I remember oh, so this, mis I did this mistake, yeah, I did this mistake. And then I was lazy and I did this, oh, okay. which you, uh, the thing you advise against. And then I was hang hangover and I did this. So, <laughs> no, it's not funny, Gilda, no, not at all, not at all. But <laughs> let's... <laughs> Let's get, um, uh, what, what is really interesting here is that like uh, all through the book you don't discriminate between the different types of art writing that, are, that exist today. You don't just say, yeah, the best writing is the catalog writing or the best writing is the blog, is, is the, like, this uh, you know, airy-headed person who can write anything in a blog. So, uh, but some good obviously, obviously these types of writing are very different. Do you think that there are qualities that are kind of, um, you know, equal for all types of art writing? Uh, well, yes. I think, I think good art writing uh, doesn't just present a conclusion, all right? It's not just about free associating in front of a work of art, which we can all do, uh, but actually tracing where that idea came from. And there's actually a kind of ethics in this where you can, like, you, you don't just say stuff, right? We've seen politicians and others just say stuff. And you know, well, where's this coming from? And it's actually training your thinking about it. You can actually, even though we all reach different conclusions, you can trace back where the idea came from. And so I think it actually makes your ideas stronger. You know, it, it's much more persuasive writing if you can actually explain what you're looking at, why, you know, when you're directing someone's uh, looking in an artwork uh, to the, the, the ideas and the conclusions that you wanted. I mean, one of the problems for a critic is that we're so, we have to be so schizophrenic. I mean, one minute you're writing uh, a wall text, then you're writing a piece of criticism, then you're writing a catalog text, which is more scholarly, perhaps. We have to adopt all of these different registers just to kind of scrape by. Uh, so that, and that's very, very difficult for, um, stu well, for anyone actually to, to gauge all those different voices. Uh, and also, for example, at school, we all learn academic writing. And a lot of what a curator does, actually, is a kind of journalism. I mean, a wall text, if you think that, is much closer to journalism. Yeah, all right, it it's, it's fact-based. You start with something very catchy, and you substantiate it, and you sort of end somehow bringing the whole thing around. That's classic journalistic structure. Uh, but no one who goes to art school, I mean, you're lucky if you learn how to write academically. You're never going to learn uh, what good journalism is. And, and a lot of art writers actually write a kind of... Uh, journalism or subjournalism. Um, so that was that was my. I, so I do think there's good qualities where you can actually follow someone's thinking from the artwork to the words. Mm -hmm. um, if you're just throwing the art, you know, words at artworks, and there's all the gaps in between, mm -hmm. then it's very. It's just a very frustrating experience to to read. Yeah, the throwing throwing words at the an artwork thing, which we also discussed earlier. Uh, it's like your your book, the first substantial example of good writing you you have put in it is a passage from Walter Benjamin uh, about uh, from his text from 1940, I think, 41. And uh, it was one of his last texts, it's the last will and testament, the Jewish exile uh, on the run from an increasingly fascist Europe who is disillusioned, uh, disillusioned in um, the Marxist dogma that he had to kind of, you know, prescribe intellectually uh, when he was not in danger, now he's he's kind of no, I'm I'm not into this anymore. And this passage about Paul Klee's drawing, the angel, um, Paul Klee's angel, you you kind of you you put it there, mm -hmm. and you say, yeah, if you can reach the same intensity, then go ahead, uh, write something like this. But, also but if still, you were starting, but still, start Benjamin's there. writing as a whole, <laughs> I think. Uh, is the reason of so much awful 
over general generalized curatorial and museum texts right now and any texts, I mean, efflux included. So you start with it, it's kind of a dangerous start a for, dangerous, a, for but, a book. So I don't know how it is in Russia, but I, I, I say when I give that, this is a very rocky road to follow. So in other words, what Benjamin, what Benjamin is doing there is seeing things in the work that are not there. Okay, he's, he is, he, he's seeing rubble at the angel's foot that is not there. He is completely projecting ideas onto this angel. And you, actually, you said a very interesting thing. It could have been any artwork. You're yeah. right. It could I have think, been any artwork. I think so, yeah, in and, his state at the time. Right. And so there's these huge gaps between what is being seen and the conclusions. And I do write, this is, I write that. This is a terrible model. I mean, if you have Benjamin's imagination and writing craft and a kind of conviction, and who does? I know <laughs> nobody, right? Uh, okay, but really, it's a it's it's a much much better. That's sort of the. I start with that to go backwards to say, okay, how do you actually fill in the steps between what you're looking at and the ideas you might conclude in a in a text? The other thing is, um, what I see with my students is they have, they really can't assess a text. All right, so the Benjamin text. Is, is really great writing. And I wanted to explain why. Why is it so influential? All right, what was he doing there? And so I tried to look at, I look at some classic important writers and I look at very, very unknowns as well. And how, I actually wanted to kind of show what the difference between what, good, what is good writing? Why do we still read someone like Benjamin? I mean, the other thing that's important with Benjamin is you've got to think for, for really until the 60s and 70s with exceptions like Benjamin, who of course gets translated into English only in, 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 in the 70s. You only wrote about art in terms of art history. And we forget that. You talked about art only in terms of form, uh, school of, um, materials. It's only from the 60s and 70s that you start looking at theory and politics and film and what's going on in the rest of the world to look at art. And Benjamin was doing that way, you know, far, many, many decades before anybody else had thought of that kind of writing. So I think he is, uh, I, I'm going to defend the Benjamin, I think that is the place to start, even though it's probably not the place to start for an art writer. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Uh, just to see what art writing can actually do. It's like the scope that you might possibly go for, but never <laughs> yeah, should, yeah, actually. Take never actually time. should, yeah? Take your time. Do not try this at home. <laughs> don't, don't try this yeah. at home, okay. Um, uh, you've mentioned also that uh, you, you teach for different groups of people, different groups of professionals, and you mentioned that still, coming back to the artists, the artists are kind of a difficult bunch to, 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 to yeah. teach. And um, maybe you will start with examples of why, how they explain to you why they fail. Maybe there's something well, in that that I, could explain this, sure. you know? I mean, I just uh, love teaching the artists. We, uh, I, I, one year at Goldsmiths, I spent a year, I, I mostly teach curators to write, which is delightful. And one year I tried, to, I thought I, I'd try to teach the artists to write. Um, and although I had a great time, we had great conversations, uh, I, 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 I told you, I think I got one good sentence yeah, out of the yeah. entire 60 students, which was a student who said, uh, my sculpture is best transported in a Tesco bag. Which I thought, that's brilliant. You, you know the weight of this thing, you know the cheapness of it, you know that you can kind of... Although that, that really explains a lot about the art. It was the one kind of good writing. What, what happened with artist students, is, artist students is that you will know there's these terrible things called artist statements, which I, I'm actually against. I, th I, I think they're really, they're formulaic. You take a little bit about your media and a little bit about ideas. They're, 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 they're a particular, they're, they're actually I think worse than press uh, <laughs> statements, press releases. And I assumed that I was there to get them out of writing that way. Okay. By, by doing what? By, by... by actually teaching them how to write. Ah, okay. Actually thinking about how to use language to get at ideas, not just filling in some blanks. I call that the monkey statement because a monkey can write it. I, and I you know, write it, spend it, spend five minutes writing that thing. I work in video and installation. I look at the internet and how identity is constructed and constructed in social media. I mean, they all say that anyway. Okay, fine, take five minutes. It's five minutes you'll never get back in your life. Do not spend more time than that. If you're interested in writing, that is not writing. Okay, get it done, but forget about it. 
and then let's talk about writing. And and that was um, that was a big jump. It was a much bigger jump than I thought. Um, so uh, so actually, by the end, I would I would look at them. I would look at fiction. We didn't really look at art writing. We looked at. I had them bring in their idea of the best writing they've ever read, so we could look analytically at what what good writers do in any genre. And I, I think I think I, I think they kind of got us. I had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> did they? Did they, did they have improve? a good time? They had a great time, but I don't think they learned how to write. Artist statements, yeah, that, that, that's a funny thing actually, and you can always tell when the artist when the artist goes into prepared mode. So you, yeah. you talk to him like or her like a living person, and then what what does he work about? Yeah, it's like. <gasps> And the artist yeah, statement yeah, yeah. comes it's out. It's a spiel. It's and spiel, see, yeah. I always, I always, well, if some, if an artist struggles to write, which there's no shame in it. And that's why I always Absolutely, take the yeah. Warhol example. He couldn't write. He, some but people they say, are uh, pressured. Like a, yeah, like, but so get someone to work with you. Use a tape recorder. Use, use, use your your friend who writes beautifully and construct. The, why this idea that you have to artisanally sit there and fight through learning to write about art, which 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 has been done for many, many generations. There, there, are, there are options, okay? In fact, some people, you know, there was the assumption maybe that a book called How to Write About Contemporary Art is like, tells you the formula. There is no formula. It's, it's, it, my hope was that it would open up, you know, here's, here are possibilities, here, here is the, you know, you, you don't know how to write a press release. You know, you, you, there are a million other ways to, this is a particularly free, self-published, piece of paper that has its own laws unto itself. Do what you want with it, you know? Mm -hmm. what, who told you you need, you could have four different ones. One is the straight one for the press, one is, you know, like, make it up. There, there are no rules. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, there's always an option even for people who struggle with writing. Um, for example, in my, in my classes, it's never necessarily the mother tongue uh, English speakers who come up with the best ideas because I find non-native English speakers have thought of very creative solutions by making lists, by extracting ready-made text. They, they've come up with ways to deal with the fact that they have to write in English. And some, some of them are very, very, very imaginative how to get around writing a press release or how to get around writing a catalog text. So I'm, I'm very curious in the, all of those solutions some of which can, can be really quite exciting. And the Benjamin, for example, is completely innovative. To look at an artwork and project a politics on it was, was really, really, no one had, you know, I mean, Diderot had done some speculating, but mostly it wasn't, there wasn't quite a that lot, kind of. A lot, a huge amount of speculating. Diderot was sure. the first speculator, oh, I think. He was the first, he was. The he first was. art critic was the first speculator, yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah, so. But, but I'm interested also in just, um, you know, understanding how visual language works. Uh, you know, Lawrence Wiener says, learn to read art. It's true, learn to read art, and then your writing gets much better. Once, you're a, once you have confidence in front of an artwork, you don't feel like you need a piece of paper in order to access it, which we all do. We all have this piece of paper that, you know, supports our art looking. Well, you know, actually, you want to be writing that yourself in a, in a way, even if you're... Mm -hmm. Not necessarily commissioned to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this, this question of, I think you mentioned it, and I think in more or less a, a passing way, of, uh, you know, the danger of trying to explain an artwork. Mm. It, it's, yeah, I, I know that it's a mystical thing. that Everybody <laughs> says that when they can't say anything about the work. So yeah. let's, let's leave it at that. Let's not explain what it does. But still, I think for a lot of people, there is a, uh, a kind of a um, you know, dark side to be uh, of being able to articulate something about visual material. Yeah. And I think for writers, for me, it was certainly true. Uh, there is this like threshold between the work and the starting of writing. And this threshold you have to kind of overcome yes. by a kind of intrusion into the workspace. So yeah. um, do you think that this fear should exist, this fear of the articulation? Well, it, the fear is a fear of ridicule. I mean, you could very quickly start sounding ridiculous. And the, the history of caricatures and cartoons 
of critics walking up to an artwork, you know, and, and yeah. mistaking this for an is very old. Did you know that that there's yeah. always something? Punch a magazine bit, did that, I think, oh, in in, in, in Britain. Century. It's like 19th century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, where there's it's you're always on the verge of something that's just ridiculous. Okay? Yeah. and you're just and that's really the that that is the the the. I think that's the fear. Nobody wants to look stupid. Uh, but I think it also comes to when I'm trying to teach people about description, for, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you describe an artwork, especially if it's, we have time-based artworks, artworks that you know, last three hours or maybe last a summer or three years. How do you describe um, them? And, and what's important is that you actually, you're not just taking inventory of what you're looking at, you're actually directing your reader towards what you are paying attention to uh, to reach whatever ideas you arrive at later. So it's a very, very directed uh, kind of description. It's very selective. And once you have the artwork to support your ideas, the, the ridicule actually, the, ri the fear of ridicule, the risk of ridicule mm -hmm. goes down considerably uh, because you're actually looking at visual information and trusting it. I mean, artists make a lot of decisions when they make artworks, a lot of decisions. I think they're to be respected and to be observed. So to just say this artist, this artist's work is about identity. Well, identity, where? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like, and what were, it's as if, it's as if the decisions she made and make don't matter because it's always just about identity, and they do matter, you know? So I think it's, it's a way of also, it is a way of respecting the artwork mm -hmm, and taking mm -hmm. it seriously. Let's talk about, well, uh, you have uh, some examples, a lot of examples of bed writing in the book. Uh, let's talk about the uh, importance of bed writing, because <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, the art world is not a, uh, it's like, uh, it's less discriminating to bad art writing because Very there's tolerant no of bad writing. there's no alternative. It's mm -hmm. like uh, a movie comes out and you have lots of bad writing about a movie, but there's a PR person who just sits there and collects it in a big, huge, you know, right. uh, this but, thing. But for for the, in the art world, the, the stakes are higher and the standards are, st standards are I think a bit lower because uh, if you don't try it, you this artist or this artwork might never get written about oh, at actually, all. Yeah. So the right. importance of bad writing, let's right. discuss that. No, I mean, of course, we were saying how writers, all artists, most, when I asked artists, you know, what, what's, who's written importantly about you, a lot of them say, I, I, I don't care what they say, I just care that they wrote something. <laughs> yeah, paid so much attention. exactly. But the thing is, I always say, if, if everyone in the art world basically has, so you're a writer, I'm a writer, we chose to write about art. Mm. A lot, I think a lot of people in the art world did not choose that. Artists in particular, but not just artists, curators, uh, you know, very well-known curators do not write. Hans Ulrich Obrick does not write. Casper Kudik does not write. They only do interviews. Um, I always think, imagine if everyone in the art world had to make art in order to participate. The art would be terrible, right? And you'd come up with formulaic, generic art making. I'm not an artist. I'm, I, I don't know how to make art. If I had to make art to participate in the art world, it would be terrible. And, and I think a lot of art people who have to write to participate in the art world who aren't particularly inclined to do so, they kind of resort to ready-made phrases, formulas, they fill in the blanks, uh, because they, it, it doesn't necessarily come to them with a particular grace and ease, okay? And I feel for them, I really do, I feel for them because they often have very good ideas, uh, they're worth, uh, you know, it's worth having them as part of the art world, uh, and uh, it was perhaps to help them find, uh, to find their voice. We were talking about the internet, I think the internet's been a very, very good thing for art writing, I think it's relaxed, uh, the language, it's made people some are much less self-conscious on screen than on, on the page. Uh, there's, there's of course, much less editing, so the fact-checking is often hilarious. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's actually eased things up. Uh, and also, anybody who wants to write about art can and get it published. And we know about, uh, there's a very uh, interesting guy named Brian Dracour, who you might know yeah, about in he's the a friend. States. And he wrote, he, he does reviews on Yelp. He writes art reviews on Yelp. Brilliant. This is the best thing. It's yeah. a great idea. There's a space available for reviews, and usually it's for, you know, like, 
but delicious cocktails or flea bag hotels or whatever, and he does it for art exhibitions. And he's invented, he sort of uses that language um, to uh, create another voice, another kind of, 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 of critical writing. And most, most writing in the art world is not critical writing. I think that's another thing to notice, that wall texts and um, a lot of journalism and press releases, it's not critical writing. It's this other, it's this other sort of somewhat descriptive and informative voice and that there's there, we don't even really have a name for the person who does that job mm -hmm. in art I call them the art the resident scribe most galleries now have a resident scribe uh, someone who does all of the different uh, language based skills because there, there's so many of them and they're so difficult so it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, re it's a really changing uh, landscape um, even if you know I, art criticism is the one that interests me the most. Mm -hmm. I mean, does does he do Sterl do art criticism? No, she has a, a different form of. It's really visual culture, a new, a new, a different kind of essay writing, which is really, really, very, very exciting, based on lectures, as we know. So yeah. it's a very, very, very interesting hybrid way of of creating text. Yeah, but it's like her lectures. It's a continuation of her artwork in different media. It's like a, she can have a lecture or she can have a text with lots of, usually lots of visual materials. Lots of visual materials. So she's very good. I mean, I, I work with her text a lot with my students because she really takes the visual material and is very able to analyze it in language, very inventively, okay? And she usually takes an idea and then turns it upside down. She tests her ideas beautifully. I mean, I think uh, from, even though it's, she's inventing a very, very new way of writing, it's, she's very, very, clear what she's doing. You can learn a lot from her kind of, she's very disciplined actually, of how she explains her ideas through visual um, material. So she thinks like an artist uh, who's able to write. I mean, mm -hmm. she, I think she's, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I think she's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I totally agree, but let's get back to the okay. critical writing. Okay. I, mean, um, I was thinking about that phrase that your student, the artist, the sculptor, said, wrote about his or her work. And oh, it, yeah. uh, my sculpture uh, is, can be... Is best transported best in Tesco transported bag. Best transported in Tesco bag. Is this criticism, actually? Is this a critical phrase, actually? It's because a descriptive it's a, phrase. It's a very, very it's, good descriptive phrase. It's just description, because uh, Tesco bag is something really, like, cheap. cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. Perhaps it is. It, well, Where does the criticism start? I mean, yeah, uh, most of the wall text and the press releases use like adjec adjectives that like the greatest, the first, the most, and all right. that stuff. But where does the criticism really start in a piece of art writing? Well, what is the moment of text becoming it's critical? Very, very difficult to say because once upon a time you'd have said the moment of judgment. <laughs> But it's critics. Critics rare, don't always judge, and actually, we're trying to look at multiple sides of the same work. Can I? I just want to. I just want to make a point about the Tesco bag. Okay. okay. Is that? And, and this is like a technical point in the in the book. Nouns, okay, are a much better way to describe than adjectives. Okay, a Tesco bag, it, it tells you about the economics of the thing, it tells you what it weighs, it tells you about its size. Uh, I remember once working with a student who was talking about a performer uh, who she rolled around on the stage and she was jumping about and she was unpredictable and playful and she had all these adjectives to describe it. Mm -hmm. And then we said, well actually you could describe it, she moved like a puppy. And that was it. And a puppy is, it's, 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 a, it's an attitude, it's a movement, it's all of those adjectives. And an image. It's like. an image. And so that's really always what I'm encouraged. If you can create an image in someone's mind, not necessarily an image that is the, the image you're discussing, but the image of your idea, uh, or tell a story, I might add, like Freud always did, uh, uh, you know, that, that, I think that's the best way to communicate. But it's, it's, it's difficult, it's skillful, you know, mm -hmm, it's, it mm -hmm. doesn't come intuitively. Um, but it is, I think it's worth attempting because it's, it's much more efficient. The other thing is that we have in the art world what I call this, the, the cult of brevity, okay? Um, which is short text. Give it to me, short, 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 short. Uh, those, the Freeze art book for the art fair that some of you might know, it used to be, I think it was 500 words, then it went down to 200, now it's two sentences. Okay, mm. to describe not just an artwork, but a whole artistic practice. 140 so, characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah? It's, uh, it's precisely. Uh, so it's shrunk um, 
which is one of the reasons I, 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 I'm fairly against artist statements. Artist statements are a shortcut, all right? They're asking artists to collude with the shortening of time that you devote to the work, because you're giving them the juice. You know, here's the, here's the concentrated meaning. Don't waste your time actually <laughs> looking at the art to get there. Uh, so they're actually forced to um, accelerate the consumption of their own work. Uh, so I, I think they're very, very dubious dubious things. They're, they're shortcuts. Art mm -hmm, texts can mm -hmm, be shortcuts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, at their worst. What's the part about ad adjectives and nouns? Was it, it's also supposed to be funny, yeah? Uh, because I remember me no. sitting at my uh, <laughs> sitting at the table with a text and erasing all the adjectives out of that and trying to <laughs> substitute it with yeah. them with nouns or something more substantial. If you can. Hard work. Yes. It's very hard work. Ah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the most common advice, we were talking about Stephen King. If you, if yeah, you you're a fan of Stephen King. Oh, absolutely. This, this is important. He's yeah. a great writer. <laughs> He's a great writer. He's great at creating images. He really is. He's a very visual uh, writer. I've learned a lot from him. And also, he wrote a book on writing called On yeah, Writing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're a writer and you're just the best guide, except for this one, of course. Um, but um, and he says he says it's adverbs. Just go through your text and get rid of the adverbs. Another sort yeah. of hack, another tip yes. is the word and. Go through and find all the ands. So if you're describing, yeah. like pick one verb to describe what someone is doing. All right, it doesn't unveil and unpack challenge and excite. You know, all of those this dual, all that doubling up. Uh -huh. uh, actually, it's much. It, it, writing is really much clearer when you you pick the one word, especially verbs and 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 adjectives. And it's it's a hack. You know, it's a way to streamline your writing and be decisive. Uh, if you read really really persuasive uh, art writers like Greenberg, just notice he never he almost never uses adverbs. The maybes and the almost, and the, those things kind of hedge your, they soften your writing. And actually, if you want to sound quite convincing and, pers and secure, just, just, just lose them or save them for when you want to sort of hedge your, your ideas. So it, it's basic writing, actually. This, is, this isn't just for art, this is for everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know that you, you and me, we have, um, our favorite stereotypical phrasing that yeah. is everywhere in the art art writing. So yeah. please share yours and I'll share mine. Okay, well, one audience. is blurring boundaries. That's an easy one. <laughs> Why is that? Well, <laughs> can you explain? Can you rationalize? What I guess what I was just saying, it's, a, it's the hedging thing. Anything blurs boundaries, right? So once you once you talk about that, you're not re you don't have to be decisive about any, th any, you, any response, really, to the artwork. I think the other one that really, really is hilarious is the one that constantly comes up. I think when people write that the the, the viewer uh, completes the work. Yeah, like, yeah that no one. That or one. another one, my students are not allowed to use, uh, the artists were not allowed to say, my, my artwork involves a selection of materials. Is there such a thing as an artwork that does not involve a selection of materials? And Paul, even if you have an empty room, even if you're doing it in a Marina Abramovich, you've chosen to, to select out all of the conventions. There's no such thing as an artwork that is not a selection of materials. Uh, and, and one thing we tried actually with my, when I was trying to teach artists and failed mm -hmm. was to write an artist statement that could apply to any artwork under the sun since Tutankhamun. And we, and we, and we did, we came up with artist statements that are so generic. How many boundaries. words, how many words? Oh, I, well, we had a 150 version and a 200. Did it have the word investigation there? <laughs> uh, poss quite, quite possibly, <laughs> structure, image. The, the Identity really. and investigation. Investigation <laughs> is so the operative are, word. What are your least Creating favorite? a dialogue. Creating a dialogue is the absolute best, I think, yeah, because yeah, yeah. you usually get it in the press release for a show uh, that is supposed to happen. And like, uh, this artist makes a completely new work for this museum show, and it creates a dialogue. Like, no, it doesn't because the show isn't open yet and maybe it will never create a dialogue if the work is bad and if it even if it did create a dialogue at your curatorial department uh, we don't care about it, about your dialogues uh, yeah. before the work although I mean I was very there, there were a few articles came out that were making fun of all of these ready-made phrases yeah, yeah, yeah. and I 
It's a little, it's like shooting ducks in a barrel. I mean, there's, and I just Sure, thought, but still fun. <laughs> there's, it is fun. And I thought, okay, so, okay, those are the bad. I really wanted to concentrate. Okay, so what are the good ones and why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which I think you can learn from rather better, although you can. I know I do have certain phrases. That I, they should create a laptop that when that it rings a bell whenever you start writing an art cliche. It goes ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you realize that you're on very dangerous ground. That and, uh, would be a great app, yeah, yeah, or maybe yeah, app. for yeah, the, the for art cliche app. Art cliche yeah, app. Yeah, that, but we'd that, all be guilty. That so. would that would be great. <laughs> um, uh, I'm curious as um, the examples in your book. You have plenty of examples of writing. It's mostly the Western canon of writing, yeah. and I'm just I'm curious as to how you discussed your book in the Korean translation. And how did you discuss with the publishing house who did the Korean translation? I did, I, because I, it was like this, I, I'm, I, I, I you weren't. it's beautiful like this book and it's done. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it in your Twitter account. It's, it's all done. Beautiful it's South, South Korean publishing thing. style. Yeah, I mean, but, I was actually, uh, I, actually when I was writing it, it was very much about the English language. And aside from the Benjamin, and there's a text I think by Isabel Groff, mm -hmm. uh, every, I, it, I was actually quite keen that they were in original language. Uh, not least because I know how to write in English. I mean, I know, it's like, like the Stephen King examples. I'm, does it work in other languages that get rid of the adverbs? I don't know. Um, it does. The it adverb does. thing, the adverb adject thing adjective does. thing, yes. Yeah. Right. They, it was assumed, when I wrote it, and this is another reason it's so wonderful to have it in Russian, I was assuming that this was, it was quite, um, I, I, you know, I was very aware that um, it's why I didn't want translations or almost very, there's only two, uh, so that it was really about the notion that English is by and large the lingua franca, but you know, it doesn't need to be. And I'm, you know, I'm glad it works in, in Russian. I, I'm assuming it, it, does. it does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> the, the, the technicalities that you, yeah, it, it does. Uh, so um, maybe you will tell us a, a little bit more about how you personally started writing about art. Because right. I think every, every person who does a good job at that uh, has a kind of this creation myth, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What is your creation myth? Well, no, it, I guess I was an editor at a magazine called Flash Art for a long time. And, and you didn't write anything well, yourself. Well, I wasn't allowed to write. Okay, so you there wasn't was a, allowed? No, there was a real resistance okay. for the staff to be creating content. Okay, so uh, it was quite frustrating uh, for me. So it was when I, then I moved to London uh, and actually started writing for a magazine called Art Monthly. Uh, which was wonderful, mostly because they don't edit. That's their rule, mm -hmm. uh, is that what, what you submit, they publish, okay? Unless it's really completely crazy factual error or they just, they, or they just toss it in the bin. Uh, and so I wrote for them for many, many, there's more, let's say, prestigious um, magazines, but that was the one that I thought, I wanted that freedom, I mm -hmm. really did. Uh, it's very, very, it's very upsetting to have your work rewritten and changed. So I wrote for them for a very long time. And then, um, actually, I wrote a, a text for Art, Art Monthly, which was a little cruel. Okay, it was a cruel text about a particular artist. And after that, I had three magazines write me and say, oh, write for us, we like you. It was very, it was funny, so they claimed. I'm not gonna tell you who the artist was, or and, and anyway, so I was lucky enough to, for Art Forum to ask me, and, and that for me We will was, Google that. Yeah, oh, okay, good luck. And, um, uh, and Art Forum is wonderful. They have a, the, the editor there is a guy named Barry Schwabsky, who's a published poet, very sensitive, very capable editor. I'm allowed to write about any artist I want. Sometimes people think that magazines uh, review the artists who advertise. I've heard this so many times. I've, I mean, I've been working 25 years. I'd, I've never had that. I've never, ever, ever had someone, you know, sort of nudge me towards a person, certain artist or nudge me away from another. I just write, if I, you know, I just say this, I'd like to write about this show, and they always just say yes. Uh, so maybe, maybe other people have different experiences, but I've never seen that particular commerce review, uh, mm -hmm. that particular... Um, uh, you know, conflict of interest. I just write about what I what I want to write. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's lucky. Uh, you mentioned the mean review, and when when there are you know discussions of why criticism is dead, mm. and every year we have a discussion about that. I think since right. uh, time immemorial, um, most people say, like in the art world, that critics are uh, too cautious 
and they are right. not mean enough to the artists, to right. the museums, to the... Do you think it's the case, actually? And do you think that uh, the art writing has to be meaner? Um, I have a lot to say about that. One is, one is it depends do. how you're commissioned, okay? So, for example, at Art Monthly, they would say, go see this show and write what you think about it. In, in which case I would do exactly that. And sometimes I liked it, sometimes I didn't, and I would write what I thought. Whereas, for example, Art Forum and most magazines are like this, you choose, and I get one show a month, and, and one every two months, really. And it seems quite perverse to pick the show you didn't like. You know, I mean, it's bad enough, I see hundreds of shows, and to actually fairly perversely pick the one you dislike the most, I'd much rather support a young artist. It just seems like a waste of an opportunity. Um, but I will say, I, I did once write um, Time Out. I used to write for Time Out in London. Time Out does it the other way. They just say, go see the show and tell us what you think. So I went to see the show, which wasn't so great, and um, I did write a very nice review. It, it was meant to be about punk, and I wrote this show's about as punk as Ikea. And it was about as punk as Ikea. Anyway, I accidentally ran into the gallerist, the guy who put this show together, 15 years later. Okay, and he didn't know he was going to write. We ran into each other at a party, and we were chat, chat, chatting. And then he said, "What's your name?" And I said, "Jilda Williams." And he went really dark. <laughs> and, I, and then he told me, you know, you wrote a really heavy review. And I was like, oh, I, you know, we're at a party. Oh, I couldn't have been that bad. And he recited to me, word for word, what I had said. And I checked it, and it was right. It was like lodged in his brain, you know what I mean? Word for word. So, you know, it's, it's not a great way to make friends. <laughs> well. uh, but I did, I mean, when it was commissioned in that way, I did write what I thought. Uh, but not when I'm when I have to be super selective. Then I'd rather um, find somebody I want to support. Mm -hmm. But you uh, know, in, in a way, there's a niche for mean critics. A oh, yeah. cri niche for mean criticism, and it like in England, I assume it exists in as a one-man show of Jonathan Jones at The Guardian newspaper. Yeah. So yeah. this guy takes all the meanness that doesn't exist elsewhere yes. in the art writing, right. and he just puts it in, yes. in his blog. Yes, and all of the shows that everyone loves, he hates, hates. And, and, all the, and vice versa. And, vice versa. Right. and so he's, he's carved this niche for himself, although it's a bit of a double-edged sword, because if you are supported by Jonathan Jones, it's because everybody doesn't like your work. So it's a bit of a stigma, actually, for him to be on your side. Uh -huh. It's not necessarily the most supportive thing uh, he could do. But that's his, yeah, he, that's, that's, the, that's the game he, 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 he takes. He takes the other side, okay? And I, 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 um, I prefer, I think, Adrian Searle at The Guardian. I think it's more considered. But okay, somebody, somebody's got to play the bad guy. <laughs> well, Adrian is much more balanced than yeah. Jonathan Jones. Jonathan yeah. Jones just lays it out. Yeah. But it's and great entertainment. We, we, haven't, we haven't really touched upon the um, art writing as part of this entertainment machine. And do, do you think that uh, um, there is need, f well, to put it in another way, what areas of write, art writing uh, are in most dire need of new voices and new um, people. Like uh, maybe it's the mainstream newspaper writing or academic writing or something else. What do you think? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, academic writing, n they know that they need help. <laughs> and, and I think that there have been, there are options, although very, 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 very slowly um, taking place. I mean, everyone has tried. Okay, if you look at the history of art magazines, it's about the, who they reach, okay? Art magazines started, they were just for artists, then they're mostly for critics, then they become about collectors. Uh, everyone has tried to crack the art magazine for everyone, okay? It's, a, it's, it's like the holy grail of art publishing. Uh, and uh, no one's actually found a way and, and I'm not sure if it's a contradiction of terms. In other words, people are interested in art because there's a certain um, funneling, a, a particular ritual to access it. Uh, artists like to be, have been selected by people who are specialized, uh, and this gives a, a kind of weight to their work. So that, the, the, that kind of popularization through language is very, very difficult to crack. I've, I've been involved in at least three 
publishing projects, a, a book publishing project and, and, and magazines that were trying to find a language uh, that would be accessible and yet taken seriously. And is there such a thing? I mean, the most interesting art writing in Britain right now uh, are people like Olivia Lang and um, Brian Dillon, who they, they cross memoir with experiences of art. All right, so it's part of their everyday living, okay? And, and then there's some novelists like Tom McCarthy who's really kind of uh, looking, at, looking at telling, describing an image over and over and over. Uh, so the, those are the more interesting sides, but they're, they're the opposite. They're the opposite populars. They're even more kind of refined relationship between image and art. So um, I don't know, if, whoever cracks that, if it's possible, will... Um, that would be quite something. So not art writing that's taken seriously, but is accessible to all. Very difficult. Yeah, I think we struggle with the same problem here yeah. uh, in the Russian language, uh, with the Russian language audience and with the Russian language art writing. But I, I, I can see that you're not that against the I in art criticism. Yeah, no, I'm old fashioned that way, yeah. Uh, could you maybe, maybe you know, describe the boundaries of that I because it could be too, too large for uh, the yeah. critic, and maybe there is such a thing as a too small an I? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, the dirty word in art writing is formalism, okay? Where you're completely reliant on uh, form as having content. And so you don't spill off into what it might mean politically, what it might mean, okay, that it's completely tied into. And that's a very you know, relationship of the eye of what you're seeing. Uh, and was, of course, why the ready-made was, was, was trying, attempting to get away from that uh, particular dependence. But I think a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of our art language was um, really innovated in the, in the 60s, so 50 years ago now. Okay? Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. people, even young artists, don't realize that a lot of the art language, the, the cliches, uh, I, my art is process-based, for example. That would be a kind of term that came right out of the 60s. You know, 50 years ago, that's a long time ago. You know, I try to impress on my students that, you know, they're 20 years old and they're using language as if it were radical that is, you know, older than their, their, their grandparents, you know? So mm -hmm. I, it, it's, I think in that sense, you, generationally, I think we're kind of stuck in a particular... Uh, a, a particular vocabulary, if not just way of writing about art. And I think that, that can really, that could be fairly easily expanded. I actually, I actually have lists of, of banned words to my students, which is a joke, okay? Mm -hmm. But I, there's all of those kinds of terminology uh, about, like they're not allowed to use the word conceptual. They just can't use it, mm -hmm. all right? Well, how, how can you work around that? And it actually stretches their uh, use of, of um, of language. You mean conceptual with a small c, not as concept art or conceptual art. Both, so are, small, out. Both are out. Both are yeah. out. Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting well, you know, boundary just, to But no, it just forces to them to think about language afresh, OK? And usually, and sometimes I'll give them lists of words that they have to put into the text. And they're usually verbs. Mm -hmm. Can you write with the word relieve, resort? And, and compact as a verb, you know, like I, like just just to force them to think widely. I, I don't know if you know this story. It's my favorite story is that Hunter Thompson, the guy who wrote Leaving Las Vegas, mm -hmm. he took a Great Gatsby, and he retyped the whole thing. Mm. And they said, "Why did you do? Why did you do that?" And they said, "Well, I just want to see how it would feel to write like that." And and it's it's just an interesting. It's it's just to, poor guy. It's just to change your relationship to writing. And a lot of writers do weird things like that. Uh, Benjamin had very particular ideas about his pens. You probably know. Mm. He's very no. yeah. He did his thirteen rules of writing. He's very very particular about the stock of paper and his pens, just to make you aware of that process. And you never get formulaic. So that my my list of banned words is. In that spirit, just mm -hmm. to make you think, not do it automatically. Mm -hmm. So the language that the curators and the artists, your students use, is uh, they try to use language that is 50 years old. Uh, so. But uh, isn't that isn't that you know? Uh, suggestive of the situation with the art itself. Yes, maybe, absolutely. Maybe the art is also kind of lives off 
Sure. Uh, those ideas, the 50-year-old ideas, the grandfather's ideas. Yeah, and, and the most innovative writers. See, Hito Sterl doesn't write like that. Liam Gillick doesn't write like Well, uh, borderline. Uh, but Seth Price <laughs> sure. doesn't write like that. John okay. Kelsey doesn't write like that. I mean, their use of vocabulary is really new, I think. Uh, so they're actually often the models or the examples uh, that I use. I mean, I my classes, I always have students, we start that they bring me their favorite example of art writing, because it's not what I say. And we always find the suggestions or the rules that I list, because it's, the, it, they're, they're, it's, it's actu they actually do, you do encounter that, but sometimes <coughs> they don't. Sometimes there are writing, writers who are really doing things differently, and those, you know, it's really interesting to see what they're, uh, what they're doing. For example, uh, bringing in description at the end. It's, it's very risky to do that, to tell you what, it, but, but it, and a lot of amateur writing does that. But to do it quite skillfully is sort of mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of people, and I think it's the last question before we take the questions from the audience, uh, for a lot of uh, art writers, art critics especially, a, uh, the best thing to happen in a career or in a period of you know, work is to encounter a work that is super challenging to write about. Is that the same for you? And oh, do you yeah. think it's uh, important to oh, yeah. look for the work that is that uh, that is so that the words don't just flow out oh, automatically? Yeah. It's a great way to test, actually, if you have to write about something, you about a certain artist, and you begin to research it and look at it. And sometimes a half an hour later, you got it and you can write it up. And sometimes you start and you never start. Actually, Ugo Roninonen was an artist like that, that I had to write a little review. And the more I looked at it, I, I, it was just, and then I eventually wrote a catalog on him because there was just so much, there was so much there. And mm -hmm. it, was, it, it, it was a way of testing um, you know, the quality of the writing. And I always, I do always, and I do mean this, if you have nothing to say about an artwork, and an artwork really doesn't, uh, that's glamorous. Wow. Um, is that like the equivalent of the hook? It's just night. The <laughs> night fell and the museum being, is closing. The museum is closing. Perhaps we're being given a very subtle uh, message. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, maybe, you really, maybe. if you, you do need to respond. Uh, if you have an intuitive response, trying to put that into words, I find very interesting. And I might add, sometimes people ask, who do you write for? And I definitely write for the artist. Definitely. I, I always sure. prefer, I, I really, writing for an artist who's no longer with us is for me a little frustrating. Okay. So what, is, what does she think? That's what I really care. Okay, okay. Mm. I think that's a great end to our conversation. Um, вопросы? Hello, hello. Um, you mentioned briefly the interview. Yeah. And you were saying, or Hans Ulrich, or August, or um, um, Kasper Koenig can't write. But they use, choose not to write. Let's choose go. not to write, and they use that. Can you can you just talk a little bit about the kind of interview technique because it is something that is very prevalent now. Yeah. Um, it, now, interviews are really very interesting <laughs> because they're technology dependent. They they came up with the invention of the tape recorder, uh, and it's interesting to remember that one of the first people on earth ever to own a person a portable tape recorder, not just to use it for art, but to own one was. Warhol. He was one of the first human beings on Earth. Was an artist. Okay, so the the ability for a tape recorder to access what an artist had to say, in particular, was immediately recognized. Um, and most of the, most of the um, advice I give my students on interviews uh, are technical. Okay, don't ever have a don't ever record somewhere where there's background noise. No cafes. No studios. <laughs> No, no installations. An artist will say, "Come while I'm installing the work, uh, uh, in, interview." No, no, no. We'll go in and off a quiet, somewhere quiet. Uh, never to have an interview last more than 40 minutes, because you've got too much stuff. And also, um, if you're doing a particular piece of research and you have a particular question that you really need to get out of the artist, okay? I'm assuming you're talking about interviews with artists. It has to be the first question, okay? Because artists. In, in, capable artists will answer the question they want, will direct the interview however they please. And if you're waiting for your question to come up 
it won't. Uh, so I would always uh, begin with the, 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 the really the, the kernel of what you absolutely want to get at. Usually it's something that hasn't been addressed in any other interview. Sometimes there's a reason the artist has perhaps chosen not to talk about that thing. Uh, and to go right for the jugular from the beginning. Don't start with, so how did you begin? Let's talk about your education, uh, because you'll never get there. And you'll have an interview that you've read 100,000 times. Uh, so that's, um, that would be, yes, interviewing Artist 101, <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, hi, thank you for the talk, which is like, was really, really very interesting. Uh, oh. So being in a museum uh, during, I mean, in the middle of the installation of some shows, uh, after the night of putting of the wall texts <laughs> on the walls, so could you remember a museum uh, in England or States or wherever from uh, uh, where you found that the wall text or explanatory text or all the materials that should be put in the exhibitions were absolutely amazing? So this is the best example yeah. ever. Great question. <laughs> so yes, I do. Um, the, the, a really good example was the Alighiero Boetti show, which was curated by Mark Godfrey at the Tate. And Mark, I know, insisted to write all his own stuff. Okay, so A, is a very experienced writer. And two, it was not, he did not want it watered down by the communications department. Uh, he, he really, and he's, you know, it's, it's, it's a risky strategy, but he's very, he, he really was, he brought very fresh research, pertinent research to every single work. And the, and the labels were fantastic. And it happens to be an artist I know a fair amount about. Uh, but that was a real writer and an extremely scholarly person preparing every single one of those. And those that I always cite as, as um, ideal. I might add one of the reasons I started teaching uh, the curators to write was the opposite case, in which there was a, a show was put up and the labels were sort of written and printed out, and the, the idea was they would just, you know, sort of email the labels, print them out, and whack them on the walls at, in the morning. And these labels were 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 terrible, were unusable, uh, and so it was, it, it of course, caused a huge problem with opening up the show and every all that kind of stuff. Uh, so. Um, uh, there's the uh, the opposite as well. I think there. I mean, the two extremes, the two errors, are they're either much too infantile, okay, where they mm -hmm. where they're, 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 they seem to be just for the primary school bunch, or vice versa. They're, they're, it's just throwing very very a lot of abstractors mm -hmm. at, at, at a single work of art. So mm -hmm. that they they um, those are the two extremes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I, I just, if, if there's other questions, I just, I didn't have an opportunity just to thank the garage for inviting me here. Uh, to Olga and Katya, I, I don't know if we're finishing up, and to Valentin and to Amal who took us around. We've, we, we were, it's really, really prestigious to be here and garage has a fantastic reputation. So I just, I just before, before the lights go down again, um, I just wanted to be sure that that was, uh, you know, I just want to thank everyone. You're very welcome, and we're happy to have your beautiful and really quite useful, I think, I book so. here oh, at our publishing department. Great. Hello. So um, you've written a very successful, successful book, and you've, you've worked in editing for quite some time alongside the, the um, teaching sort of experience. So um, what would be the tips to someone who's looking to publish a book about art? So any tips about someone in sort of interested in doing this sort of thing? Uh, you mean how to get published or how to... Yeah, yeah, well, publish or sort of uh, tips before getting to that level. Well, I mean, everything you need to know about art publishing is in an, uh, an art bookshop. Uh, and, and you really, if anyone is really interested, the best thing to do is to spend four hours in a really good bookshop and a notebook and understand what different publishers do, okay? How, the more you can fit into what they do, the more, the easier it is that you make uh, to publish, to get your work published, the better. So at, 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 when I was at Fiden for a long time, we were looking for Fiden books. We didn't, we don't publish uh, academic work. We don't publish artist books. And we would get a lot of proposals uh, for uh, the kinds of texts that we just, I could tell that the person 
did not know us. <laughs> and that was a real, and, the, and, and there's a huge variety of, more and more now, of, uh, so the Whitechapel uh, or Sternberg just as text, text only books, very, very strange. Uh, for us to have a, an art book without any images in it, but that's you know you follow the models that are that are on offer, uh, and see where the book that you want to write would fit, and then work around it and copy in the sense that you know how many chapters, how many artists per chapter, uh, how long is the introduction? Um, usually, uh, you know, for example, dissertations tend to be uh, by by theme. And usually, uh, books wanted by artists, for example. So that would be retailoring some research you've already done to make it more commercial or more uh, bookable. Uh, so I think if you really, books really will tell you, answer that question, even down to word counts. How big is an art book? Usually about sixty thousand words, I might add. But you know, you can you once you know that you're actually um, able to tailor your own work to something that a publisher can use. Uh, so it's annoying, it's boring, it's number crunching, uh, but it works. It really works. I might add once at Fiden we had an, an, a writer send us a book which we didn't publish, but it was so perfectly us. This person had so carefully understood what we did. We actually then had them come in and we commissioned another book because I could tell that they would be able to deliver what we, what we needed. Uh, so it's, that is really, that doing that kind of homework uh, is, 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 is worth it, assuming you have a fabulous uh, subject that has never been covered before. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question it's uh, well there's art here there's art in Finland <laughs> I mean over the border there were uh, you named uh, uh, a list of uh, critics yes the names and uh, I I'm I'm just curious would you know any Russian critics huh. that made I don't know not waves but at least are familiar to you well um Truthfully, because yeah, I lived absolutely. a long time in Italy, which has far stronger ties with Russia, I know uh, Victor Miziano. Of course, I know Boris Groys. Everyone Ziano. does. Um, putting me on the spot. Uh, the Tupitsons used to write for us. No, not really. I mean, Boris Groys would be the ops, would be the kind of superstar, even though a lot of people. Um, you know, there's some resistance to what he does as well. So not really, I think, would be okay, the answer to that. You. I should probably know more. It's actually a rather theoretical question. Okay. So considering all, all of your experience with art criticism and the fact that art criticism is dead, do you think there is a is? future for art criticism? And if it is there, then what changes have it for it? Oh, I, I don't think art criticism is dead. But oh, I think it's a very... Art, art criticism has gotten so much better in the last 10 years, okay? I think there's, people, there's much less self-consciousness. There's less, less feeling that you have to work with philosophy and theory, uh, what you can if you want, but you don't have to. Uh, there's new hybrids which involve, as I said, fiction and others. I, I, I think there's a lot of scope for art writing. I think we're just on the verge of a lot of really interesting writings, which will make it um, harder <laughs> for those who are participating in the art world and aren't good writers, because the quality, in my opinion, is going, it, it just gets better, actually. And so weak art writing, of which we've been very tolerant for decades, uh, will be um, phased, out. phased out and called out for what it, for what it is. Uh, so um, uh, I don't think art, art writing isn't it. Summing up this conversation, I'd like to say a few words of gratitude as a translator of uh, this book. Oh, okay. uh, I'm actually the one who recreated this book in Russian. Oh, thank you. And I'm very grateful to um, the publishers who are not here today. I saw some of them <laughs> walking around. Uh, but uh, I'm very flattered that they uh, offered me this book to be translated. 
Uh, and uh, so I pa I've personally passed through several stages uh, when I was translating it for half a year, <laughs> from gratitude <laughs> to frustration uh, at some point, because it was sometimes difficult. I also have to say very flattering words to my editor in St. Petersburg, who is the editor of Garage Pro series uh, uh, for Atmarginum Press. Uh, Did you keep it funny? He kept it, uh, I would say, he uh, did all tough job. <laughs> he did it, uh, he, he's very meticulous editor, which is, was extremely important for this type of the text. And uh, I'm personally grateful to you because I've used a lot from your book for my uh, course, which is called Art Speak. Oh, fantastic. Uh, and I another teach, satisfied customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I teach Russian museum workers, curators, uh, artists, how to use English language for their professional purposes. Oh, good, good, excellent. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I think it's time to say thank you and <laughs> welcome. Thank you very much for the conversation.